thank you guys for coming. Uh, Save the Hills Alliance has been around for, what, 11 years? Approximately. Uh, as a uh, 501c3, and we organized in 2011, so that's six years. And when I mentioned the fact 501c3, uh, as we engage today, uh, as a 501c3, we do not support uh, a politician or a party. I mean, there might be a trend one way or the other on different issues, but we cannot uh, sponsor or support a politician or a party. So let's keep that in mind. And uh, we have some super duper involved people in both parties, both persuasions, multiple uh, reasons for being, for conserving the land and the water. Um, we were formed in 2011 as a nonprofit. Our mission statement indicates we are dedicated to protecting the natural environment and the long term health and safety of the community by promoting the ecologically sound use of land, natural resources, public awareness, and education. Uh, when this thing when this thing was evolving, I, the first meetings I went to were 2006. It's 11 years ago. Yesterday I saw a picture at our house. I was standing next to Dick Hoffman, the guy that donated Hoffman Hills to the DNR. And uh, we had a meeting at my farm and people parked in the hay field and we met in the shed for a little while and we had a good time that afternoon. But we knew there was a big issue that had to be dealt with. Uh, also, in the beginning, there was no money. Uh, the last three or four years, uh, our group has dispersed a lot of money for educational purposes. We'd love to do that in the future, but to get money, you have to have a task to perform. You have to have a reason to solicit donations. So if you guys have ideas, what needs to be done? We've spent money on, uh, with the university on air monitoring. Uh, we've, many, 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 many groups. We've bought postage stamps and copying and whatever it takes to educate the neighborhood. And we still have some money. We'd like to help your neighborhood group out with. If you need, if you need a grant, let us know. We'll figure out a way to make it happen. Uh, but to get big bucks in the future, we need purpose. And of course, everybody jumps on the bandwagon when it's active in your backyard. Then things dwindle after a while. So uh, we'd love to work with you and your organization. Uh, I'm going to introduce the first speaker. Uh, her name is Leanne Ralph. And Leanne has been a, uh, is an author. She writes for the Colfax Messenger, and she's editor of that paper. Uh, she's written several books. Uh, and I've seen her at more meetings than anybody I've ever seen at meetings that pertain to frac sector. So if you think you've gone to a few hundred, I think she can outdo you by a couple. So uh, and Leanne's going to tell us about the basics. And we'll do a little practice. I've got paper and pencils here. She's an old teacher, and she's going to teach us. And we're going to have to do our homework. And it's going to be relatively short. Uh, you know, two hours goes really fast. So we'll work cooperatively with Leanne to get the job done. So yeah, I was well right. It was about 2006 when we first started covering, or when I first started covering some of those sand mine issues. Close to the mine, please. Town of Tainer, is that better? In the town of Tainer and what it eventually became Fairmont Minerals. So, but one of the things, I mean, we're here today for civic engagement. Why it's important to have civic engagement, to have people pay attention to what's going on in their neighborhoods. So, does anybody have a sense of how many newspaper reporters, not the number, but the percentage. How many newspaper reporters we've lost over, say, the last 10 or 15 years? 75 percent? 75 percent? 90? 70? 70? 50? <coughs> yeah, it's roughly about half. But it's interesting for me to see this group is, is kind of trending that up a little higher. 
Uh, because you've noticed there's only about half the people working to report on whatever's going on than what there used to be. Does anybody have a sense of why, why we've lost so many of our reporters? The internet, yes? Social media? Consolidation of media. Consolidation, yep. You have a big conglomerate will come in and buy up a bunch of smaller newspapers and they reorganize everything and all of a sudden they don't need as many people and so then you have half the staff. Even the office where I worked, there used to be four people who worked in that office and we're now down to me and another quarter of a reporter who, all, who spends most of her time up in Glenwood City for the Glenwood City Tribune. So, and part of this is, in the 1960s is about the time when subscriptions stopped supporting the newspapers. So then, for enough operating revenue, they started relying more on advertising. That worked pretty well until the internet came along and then the Great Recession really hit it pretty hard. And so that's part of the other reason why newspapers have lost reporters is how are they going to cut expenses? Well, you're just not going to hire back this person who's retired or that person who moved on somewhere else. The reason I bring this up, and people are probably, all of you are probably already aware of this, that it is very important even more important than ever for you to have civic engagement, to pay attention to what's going on in your neighborhoods, in your counties, whether, no matter what the issue is. I mean, we're it's Save the Hills, we're talking about the frac sand mines, but there are lots of other issues that are going on as well. And so that it's, there's fewer of us reporters to go out and report on those things. So we really need to have all of you folks out there paying attention to what's going on. One of the things that you can do uh, to bring attention to an issue is to write a letter to the editor. How many people have written letters to the editor? Oh, good. <laughs> How many of you have actually had your letter to the editor published? Good. How many of you have got <coughs> comments from readers about your letters to the editor? Okay, what kind of comments did you get? <laughs> What was that? Say that again. It's usually nasty. Oh, usually nasty comments. Yeah. I've gotten comments, quite a few at verbally in the grocery store, uh, usually positive, um, and online, a uh, mix of uh, nasty, snarky ones and supportive ones. Sure. Some today, but now we can remind me. Somebody quietly. a good point because you never know what kind of comments these letters are going to elicit. Probably what happens, you hear the negative ones. I would be willing to bet that there are just as many people, if not way more, who appreciated your letter to the editor, but they either don't see you or they're just not going to comment that they appreciated it. The negative comments are going to come to the surface more readily than the positive. But because you get negative comments, that does not mean that there are not positive, you know, people who are, are appreciative of what you're doing as well. And, you know, newspaper editors love to publish letters to the editor. They really do. Uh, everybody is always interested in what somebody else is thinking, what their, their, their opinion on a particular topic. And when it's in a newspaper, it gains legitimacy because it's come through. It isn't necessarily changed. The letters to the editor come in, they are what they are, and they're published. But they kind of gain the legitimacy by being in a print publication. So my purpose here today is we're going to work on some of these. And I'm sure you people have all had plenty of experience with this. But you know we're going to give it a try anyway and see what happens. Uh, because. 
if you haven't written a letter to the editor, or if you think that your letter has not been particularly well received, or it didn't convey the message that you wanted it to convey, but these are all some of the same principles that you can also use when you are going to speak to your local officials. How many people have gone and uh, spoken in a public comment section for a county board, town board, city council, village board? Okay, we have <laughs> quite a few people. How many people have gone to listening sessions for state representatives, state senators in a particular area? We've had quite a few people there too. Okay, what were your experiences with those? I'm getting chuckles, yes? I've done the, the county board before this whole thing started. As I said, hey, county board, we're going to get 24 new railroad sightings in Menominee. Uh, what do you think is going on? And they all looked around, yeah, are you kidding? And, uh, but you know, a year or two later, as this thing started to evolve, it started to make sense. I think they were a little bit prepared. So by going to the county board, you gave them a heads up on, on what they could expect to be coming. I just, it's going to be red. There's going to be 24 new railroad sightings in Menominee. Right. Ah, there's room for 24. What, what would you want 24? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Except, okay, guess what? Ship all the sand, right? Yeah. 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 From Fairmont. Yes. Can I just ask it, what do you mean by railroad sightings? Sidings. Oh, sidings. Sidings. Okay. okay. It was some federal report on railroads. They had to post it in some newspaper okay. that they were going to put railroad sightings in 24 or Locations in your Menominee. Okay. Wow. Okay. What's up? Yes. Um, this isn't a direct answer to your question, but it comes to mind anyway. Mm -hmm. I want to get it out there before I forget it. Um, the only reason we found out in Monona County, Minnesota, that uh, the sand sharks were about to invade was a tiny legal notice in the uh, paper of record that one of our friends saw about three mines that were being. That set off our activism, it saved our butts, got us to get enough people to that next first meeting uh, to be effective. So for a group to have at least one person who designated or volunteer to be the legal person to look at that every single day, scour them, because it's really easy to risk up there. Right, yes. Because the legal notices, they have a little, they have a little bit different uh, publication requirement. So you're not going to get this great big, you know, quarter page ad in a publication. The legal notices only have to be in, there's a certain fonts that they have to be in, and, you know, they're only going to be a certain size. But that's a really good point, is that I don't know how many times I've heard that happen as I've been reporting on, you know, some issue, all of a sudden it seems like it blows up, and people are, are upset because we didn't know about it. Well, that notice was published in the paper, that agenda was published that about this public hearing or whatever. There was, there was plenty of notification in a newspaper, but because people were not paying attention, they didn't see it, and then all of a sudden when it comes to be a public hearing or something, you've got 300 people there who are really upset because they didn't know about it. And it goes back to, again, there are fewer reporters of us to have reported on that. If there could have been more people to, to report, they might have known what that was. But that's an excellent point is to, in any group that you're working with, is to have somebody be designated to, to scour those legal notices. And they might not necessarily be in papers either. Because it's now, um, if it's a legal notice for public hearing, it has to be published in a newspaper. But if it's just something that's coming up on an agenda, the state of Wisconsin has changed their, it changed the rules, so if it's a, in a township, as long as if it's up on the township's website, they only have to post it in one place. It doesn't, it's not required, the agendas are not required to be published. And so you really have to be vigilant to, to see where some of these things are coming up. So you might want to consider doing that too, to, to um, designate somebody to kind of keep an eye on, you know, I'll take these two townships and you take that, where you think there might be some activity going on there. Um, that, that's an excellent point. Yes? Yes. Being able to be used in the official decision making 
the Wisconsin Towns Association website is where it came through. I'm also a supervisor on the Otter Creek Town Board, so I did get that notification of this bill. That's, there's, a, there's a couple of parts to it. Part of it is that, I mean, I find this absolutely shocking. Shocking, I tell you, that a board of adjustment or a county board or a town board or whatever it is would not be able to use public comments to make any kind of a decision about uh, conditions. This is specifically related to conditional use. And so the other part of that is, is that um, say a, a county or, or a board, county board or town board, whoever has jurisdiction over this particular, if it's a sand mine, because that's, that's why we're here, in order to impose conditions on the operation of that particular sand mine, if that's what we're talking about, because it doesn't apply just to sand mines, it's to, to everything. Those conditions would all have to be pre-listed in an ordinance. So you could not come up with, you know, say you're a, nobody on, that serves on any board knows every situation that occurs in every jurisdiction over which they're serving. So the, the people who serve on these boards rely on people out in the community to come in and say, well, you know, this is a really bad intersection here and maybe we want to keep this thing away from here and maybe put it over. Nobody's going to know everything. If you get to the point where, oh, gee, you have to list every possible condition in your ordinance or you cannot impose that condition, that completely shuts down your conditions. I mean, uh, that is just, yes. Yesterday, the author of that bill came out with an amendment. Okay. And basically rewrote it. But instead of listing conditions he had on there that the public would have to give substantial evidence, substantial meaning, facts, and information, as he defines it. For those conditions? Or, yeah, I haven't seen anything about the amendment, so, yes. yeah. area better than anybody else if they cannot impose any kind of conditions for the health safety and welfare of their constituents then where are we I mean you know you're we're in a pretty bad place and then if, you, if they can't listen to what the public has to say to them and they can't use any of that then we're in a really really bad place too well I guess if you had to have some figures I guess you'd go in and say well there's been so many accidents at this intersection but you know, I'm thinking like up in the town of Howard, one of their concerns with their sand mines there was with the trucks operating and then the school buses in the morning and you know, the roads are like this and they're like this and, and they were concerned with the, the sand trucks that, that they not be operating when the school buses were operating to go and pick up, you know, pick up your, pick up students. In that case, you might not have had an accident where, God forbid, you know, where you had a bunch of students get hurt or, or worse, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have any facts that you could apply to that particular particular situation. So anyway, one of the things I wanted to do today, and I know you, you're, you're all experienced at this, so I don't know if I can bring you along any farther than where you're at, but um, I'm sure you've all had this experience when you've been speaking for a, a, at a county board. The, the um, elected officials, if you go to those listening sessions, well, they want you to be pretty succinct, too because there's generally quite a few people who want to talk, and they've probably only got an hour allotted. So you want to make the most of the time, and that's the same thing with your letters to the editor. You want to make the most of what you have, because there's limited space as to, you know, how much you can, you know, how much you can write. You can't have a whole page of letters to the editor. So one of the things I wanted to work on was making that a little bit more effective for you. I mean, how many of you have had that experience where you've been speaking to a county board or a, a town board, and county board's probably more so. Um, Dunn County actually sets a timer. I mean, you know, they've got they've got this timer up there, and there's a red light, and when the red light goes, you're done. <laughs> and, yeah, but, and you can see that too. I mean, if you've got 50 people who want to talk, and they all get up there and talk for a half an hour, you're going to be at the, the meeting's going to go pretty long. So they kind of want. How many have had that experience where you've only gotten through about half? 
of what you wanted to say, and then you get a few, and you get cut off, and, and um, you don't get to make the point that you wanted to make. So there's a, what I like to think of as a really simple formula is how to do this. You know, you mentioned the bills that are coming up. Okay, you introduce your bill. This bill would do, and you could use this for a letter to the editor, for speaking to local elected officials, or at a listening session for a state, or if you're going to call them on the phone or whatever. You know, introduce whatever the topic is that you're talking about. Pick three important points about that topic. Develop those points just a, you know, a little bit. Say how it affects, it's going to affect you, or how it will affect your neighbors, or your community, or the environment, or the state, whatever it is that that, that effect it's going to have. Make those three points, develop those points a little bit, and then at the end, what you really have to do is tell people what you want them to do about it. Okay, I'm getting some nods here. The easier you make it for people to do what it is, and this is specifically true for a letter to the editor, what you want them to do about it, the more likely they are to do it. So when you say, okay, I would like to have you call your local, call our local representatives and tell them that yes, they should support this or because, or no, they shouldn't support this because. And then include the contact information. Include the phone numbers and the, I don't know how many people actually write, you know, snail mail letters anymore. You could, I suppose, include a street address if there was one available. But a telephone number and an email address. So that if somebody wants to make a comment on this, this topic that you brought up, they can easily do that. It's right there in your letter to the editor. And they can go right to their phone or go to their computer and without having to try to look up the contact information for this person. We all know people are busy. But actually, the easier you can make it for people to do things, the more likely they are to do it. And then, of course, if you're talking to local elected officials, well, then you just tell them whatever they want to do. I'd like you to vote against this or vote for this because of these particular reasons. So it's really simple. It's just broken down into three, three sections. Introduce what it is you're going to be talking about or writing about. Make three points. Develop those points. And at the end, tell your readers or the elected officials what it is that you want them to do. And, and where are we writing from? Adobe. I'm from Adobe. Oh, well, I don't uh, consider them Adobe. That far out of the area, yeah. Dunn County would take it, and a lot of other places, La Crosse would take it, but not Chippewa. But not Chippewa. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it's important for us to remember that, uh, unfortunately, newspapers don't work for their readers. They don't work for us. They work. Their, their purpose in existence is to make money. Their purpose nowadays, a lot of times, unless it's an exceptional paper, is not to inform us like we need to be informed. So if something you write tends to rub one of their major advertisers the wrong way, it ain't going to be published. Depending on the editor and the paper. The other thing you can do in those situations is, as I said, there are a lot fewer reporters. Now, I like to think of myself when I, in my job. I do work for the readers. I try to inform people, but I'm only one person. And I can only get to so many things and I can only write on so many topics. So this is the other thing, is if you know of something that's going on, you know of some issue that's coming up, you know of a, a public hearing, or you know of some situation, contact the paper. Talk, actually talk to a reporter and let that person know. At least there's a possibility that, it, you know, the, that story. So then if you can't necessarily get the letter to the editor in there, you could end up with a story about the, whatever the, the topic is, the situation is, that kind of thing. And if it's a good story, that reporter will owe you. Yes. 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 Uh, how, after hundreds of these county and town board and zoning meetings, how are you welcomed when you arrive? Uh, how do you, generally, are you welcome? Me, personally? Yeah, because oh. you write in-depth articles rather than just headlines. Yeah. Uh, I have, I have not run into any opposition from, you mean from the board members or just yeah, from people from in general? general? The people on these panels. Yeah, no, I haven't, they've all, you know, I haven't run into any problems with, knock on wood, knock on that, yeah, nobody's, 
So did you just hear the last all my reasons? Okay, yeah. Yeah, actually, well, now that you mention it, that has not, um, they're all willing to work with me. They're all willing to, if I have questions, to tell me what they can about a particular topic or where I can find more information or, yeah. So that's that's been a good thing for me. Yes? A minute ago, you mentioned Dunn County's got this thing called an overlay. Mm -hmm. Well, it's another layer of zoning as to where the sand mines could be located in Dunn County. I mean, that's one of the reasons why you haven't seen we have Paramount Minerals to begin with um, before they really had any additional zoning that had to do with, with the sand mines. And then, well, however many years ago that was, because that's been a while now, too. Um, in fact, the comment from the Corporation Council in Dunn County, that was Scott Cox. And shortly after that, then, he left to work for St. Croix County. But his comment to me was, after the county board had approved the overlay zoning, was, well, now that you won't have the sand mines to write about anymore, what are you going to write about? <laughs> so he was pretty confident that, that that extra layer of zoning there that pertains to the sand mines. That's not to say that you can't develop a sand mine in Dunn County, but there's all kinds of of regulations that you have to follow if you're going to do that. And so it's covered, it's pretty extensive. I mean, I'm sure you can find it on the county's website. In addition to that, quite a few townships in Dunn County also pass their own mining ordinances. So in addition to you know, what the town of Otter Creek did, that was before I was on the town board, but in addition to, so I'm not really sure those have, you know, there has not been an application to come up for a sand mine, so I'm not really sure how that would work. I've asked, and but because it hasn't actually been put into process yet, because nobody's tried, I'm not sure how that works. If the townships have their own, I mean, I would imagine that any applicant would have to abide by whatever is in the township's ordinance, and also has to abide by whatever is in the county's ordinance. But I don't know if one supersedes the other or not. Yes? Do you know if um, the state um, takes away local control, if all of those rules will be set aside? I would say they would try. You know, that's what, it, if they're going to take, but I think that they might have a pretty good fight on their hands. I mean, if you want to see that there would be lots of, Lots of litigation involved if you try to take away the, the local control of the, I don't think that the, the Towns Association, the individual townships, the counties, I don't think any of them would take that laying down. Yes? Well, the budget that was just passed did include a provision that pretty seriously restricted local control on um, non-metallic mines, and the Wisconsin Towns Association said that see challenges to that? Right. Yeah, because that, that's part of what Doug County's zoning ordinance, their, their mining ordinance there is, is that if it is a local, you know, for a local road improvement project or local quarries, that kind of, they're exempted from, you know, that, that so that you can still work on those projects or work on those road projects. And that's the basis, or part, that's part of the basis for the lawsuits currently uh, against Oh, the, you put a ban or just a moratorium? It's a ban. It's an outlaw ban. Okay. It's, been, uh, it's been there for a year and it's currently, it's been litigated or it's been argued and now it's up to the judge in the next couple of months to give it a thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, and this is a on a circuit court judge or is it gone? District court. District court, okay. Yes. So you're involved with a weekly paper. Mm -hmm. And so from the standpoint of a weekly paper, People such as myself that want you to be aware of something, what is it that's going to get your interest to come out or to listen to us as we um, try to explain, you know, the issues? The same thing that we're talking about for an op-ed piece, or is it something, you know, in, in the case of a, a town board that has a mining ordinance, you know, 
just disregard one of the provisions that's in it and go Ding. ahead. Okay. Yeah. Right. That right there would, yes. When you come up with those kinds of concrete examples, mm -hmm. you know, when it's things that are kind of dealing with opinion, boy, that's pretty hard for a reporter to nail that down unless there's some kind of, you know, some kind of facts, figures, some kind of <coughs> violation of a rule or a violation of their ordinance. Yeah, if you had a township that was violating a provision of, of the township's ordinance or the county's ordinance or even state law. Yeah, because that would be something then that we could definitely go after and report on. But it would have to be of local interest to your readers. Is that or of regional interest. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily, like I write for the Colfax Messenger, if it was of any interest to people in Dunn County or maybe even Chippewa or St. Croix, um, you know, because we're, we've ended up being a little more, used to be the Colfax Messenger was just strictly everything in Colfax. But with the kind of the demise of some of the other papers, um, you, you see the Dunn County News doesn't even have an office in Menominee anymore. Um, they're down to, they have a, an editor to report, and a sports reporter, and that's all they've got. But that's their interest is their readers. Yes. Not the readers of lacrosse. Right. So their interest, right. So their interest is, but... My point being is that, like the Messenger and the Tribune have become, have taken on a little bit more area than what we used to cover before. Because there isn't a really too much going on for a you know, county paper to cover that. So, you know, you never know. Try to keep it as local, but it doesn't have to, even if it's kind of a regional interest, if there's some, if, it's, if there's some local hook or angle to it. Yes? Yes, and that would be another thing because that would also bring it to the attention of the, you know, the people who are reporting. And then it wouldn't, well, and it wouldn't do that too if, you, if I do a story on it. The reporters all read the other papers because we all kind of want to know what's going on with, you know, in case there's something that's, that's local to our area or something that we should be aware of. So, I mean, either way, if you can, if you can get a story, if it's something that's, that's workable for a story, or if you can get a letter to the editor, then that is going to bring more. And the letters to the editor there could work into a story from that as well. Yeah. That's, that's a very good point, Cheryl, because, um, example, we in Winona County spent 18 months producing dozens and dozens of letters to the editor on a consistent basis mm -hmm. uh, to heighten the visibility of the issue uh, show that there were more than just a few tree huggers that were interested in right. it, and to uh, get both the public and our target, which was the county commissioners, uh, sort of in the mindset of where we were coming from. Right, and and letting them know that everybody should be interested in having clean air to breathe and clean water and that kind of thing, right? Yep. That's part of it. Yeah. You know, as you get to to make people who might not necessarily be interested in this topic or they don't particularly care whether there's a sand mine that's all the way over in that direction. But if you can show them how that could affect them personally, um, that's part of what you, you know, when you're developing your, yes? And just real quick, and, and then the other point is, because I know exactly what he's talking about, the other point is why have an ordinance if you're not going to enforce it? Yes. And that's what people need to know. Yes. Or you only enforce it in certain circumstances or right. certain businesses. Right. And that kind of thing really needs to be, if, if you see that kind of thing going on, needs to be brought to the fore. Because it's really, you know, that is uh, really going to draw the attention of a lot of, not just the town boards, but the people, um, district attorneys, that kind of thing, if you've got somebody not enforcing. Or selectively enforcing, that's also a normal. And I mean, the other thing, that I always found was that, how many of you have read the, the Supreme Court decision from the town of Cook's Valley? How about there? A couple people who have. Um, you know, that was a, that's a Supreme Court decision. And basically they said that um, any township can make any kind of, if it's in the interest of the health, safety, and welfare of their, they can limit those sand mines, or if they decide they don't want any at all because of the effect that it will have on the people who live in that area 
then under zoning or under the their and it's not zoning, it's a, what is it? Um, it's the police power. Police power, village powers. Under the village powers, they can then say no run. So I find that interesting. It seems like that, that nobody seems to pay too much attention to that. Yes? Newspapers would really like to have something that's unique to their particular paper. And if it's something that's not particularly local, um, you know, then your chances of getting it published are less. And that's the other thing, if you can find some really local angle. If you can take that letter and tailor it a little bit to that particular market where you're, you're sending it, uh, you stand a much better chance of getting that letter published than if you just have a, um, you know, kind of so if you send the same letter, but if you can tailor that in some way to that local particular community. Yes? Man, where we live, subscriptions to weekly newspapers has declined precipitously over the last 10 years. Is that true in the papers that you write for? There has been, I'd say over the last 10, yeah, there's been some decline. Um, it's not, I would actually say it's kind of funny, the Messenger is the smaller of the two papers, has had much less of a fall off, um, maybe than the little bit bigger paper. But still, our combined circulation for those two papers is more than the Dunn County News. The Dunn County News is the paper that has really fallen, mm. fallen in uh, subscriptions. So, I mean, overall, I guess, over the last 20 years or so or more with the, the, um, the advent of the internet and the social media sites and that kind of thing, you are definitely see. But now we're starting to see that there is kind of a little bit of an upsurge, that there, you know, people are kind of starting to, to you know, it's not any great rate to tear anything up, but, but they are, it seems like we're getting more subscriptions, more new subscriptions. This fall, the Messenger is, you know, probably doesn't sound like a lot, but in the last month or two, we've probably had maybe 20 or 30 new subscriptions, which is, you know, a lot better than losing subscribers. Yes? Do you think a digital weekly newspaper is a possibility where you could simply get rid of the paper paper and go strictly to a digital weekly newspaper? You could if you wanted to cut out your older readership. There are, there's a certain, there's a certain segment of that population that is not on computer. They do not have a computer at home. Um, they might go to the library, maybe, use a computer. But there, there is a certain segment of the population that you wouldn't get that way. Now, the Messenger and the Tribune, we do have digital. If you subscribe, you have a digital subscription as well. You, you, you get the print copy, or if you don't want the print copy, if you just want the, the access to the digital, then you can get access to the digital and not get the print copy. So, I mean, there is, it's probably better at this point to have a combination of print, um, print and digital. Because the print then is out on the newsstand where people are going to see that, you know, and remember that there's a newspaper. If you're just digital, there's no visual reminder at the grocery store or the gas stations or the pharmacy or any place like that that, that you have in this paper. And you can exactly. We just we just had the broadband study in Dunn County of all the the areas that there is absolutely is very poor. Um, where I live, we're just a little bit north of 170 there. 
Um, we have CenturyLink, that's what the county got there. When they did their study, their survey, that's who they got most of the complaints about. Um, the internet access is very, very slow. Um, that's available in certain rural areas in, in Dunn County. So yeah, you're absolutely correct. Even if people can use computers or do use computers, if they're in an area where there's slow internet access or no internet access, then it's not going to be good. Well, we sure had our question and answer session. <laughs> that pretty yeah. well. Thank you so much, Leanne. <laughs> Oops. personally, like a lot of you are, uh, I happen to live about a kilometer downwind of this type of destruction that you're seeing in the photos around the room here. And uh, that's, we've been living with that, my wife and I, uh, we're empty nesters now, but uh, it's been, we've been fighting that battle for uh, between three and four years now. So uh, we've done a lot of work uh, to try to stop or regulate, uh, somehow manage that type of uh, destruction to our landscape and our communities and social fabric. And uh, yeah, it, it's a frustrating process. In our particular township, we're in Jackson County in a township called Curran. Uh, we have no zoning. There is no ordinance action. We have no protection for the people. And uh, previously, the, our town board you know, was right in line with the sand mine, allowing them to come in to the tune that our current township uh, it has greater than one third of the total acreage in industrial sand mines. So that's the kind of situation I'm in, and uh, that's how I happen to get connected uh, with these types of conferences. Uh, Anyway, I, to, to help manage that along with getting legal assistance along the way, uh, I've run for, successfully run for uh, township <coughs> chair position, so I'm filling that role. And that's part of the management strategy, uh, and I'm especially interested in what Leanne has had to say and what Ken will have to say for us about improving our communication style and how to communicate, uh, what to communicate, and right time. So, but uh, it's, a, it's a tough uh, nut to crack. I feel a little bit like the guy walking into the bar with a handful of fresh dog manure and saying to the bartender, look what I almost stepped in. <laughs> <laughs> we get a little bit reactive, don't we? Uh, so, unfortunately, uh, to avoid all of those landmines, we have to physically handle the nasty stuff. Landmines and sandmines. <laughs> yes, that is a meaningful joke. <laughs> or I hope it was. Um, so, anyway, I don't want to, that's just a little background so you know uh, who I am and uh, what my connection is with this particular group. Uh, Jackson County is a little bit out of the zone, but I'm happy to travel. So, to introduce our next speaker, to uh, get us into the political savvy aspects, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Ken for the first time. Ken and Robin, my wife, last summer, they uh, came down to our residence and they brought along a, a group from Sweden, a um, television reporter and you know, nationally recognized photographer to do the story. They're a little more proactive over there in Europe. They're trying to get ahead of the sand mines, so they're putting out media stories to help prevent uh, fracking in Europe. And uh, so anyway, it was a great opportunity to get to meet with uh, Ken and Robin. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, I really appreciated uh, the energy level that he, he brought, uh, the, the political background, and uh, just the vision. It's, it's an opportunity, too, to get some sharing from Minnesota, all of the success stories that have uh, come to light uh, right across the border. Uh, so, to, to more specific 
picks on Ken, um, let's see, he's handsome, he's intelligent. <laughs> Ken, I can't read the rest of your writing here. <laughs> with your verbal 
explanation of what you're advocating for. So we like to use PowerPoint presentations. And, you know, I just back up a little. A uh, couple more. You know, we have these nice pictures of our farm, and it, you know, kind of makes people feel comfortable, like uh, there's something interesting. Go ahead. Okay, well, back. Okay. The third point I want to mention here real quickly is context. You know, whenever any of us go to a meeting and we're listening to someone present something, especially if it's someone we might not know, we should always be sitting there saying, you know, what's influencing this person? Where did this person go to school? Who does he or she talk to? What does he or she do? What kind of experiences have shaped that person's life? We should always be skeptical of people who are advocating things and ask those questions in our own mind. In the same respect, as a presenter, you can use this concept of context to help win people over to being receptive to your message. And that's why I talked about being in the legislature, working on health care issues, because that's kind of my context that I want you to know about so you're more receptive to the other things that I'm going to follow up talking to you about. So context of the speaker or of the presenter, either from the listener's standpoint or from the presenter's standpoint is very important. Next. Oops, that's the wrong place for that slide. We'll come back to that. Okay. <laughs> okay. We started our war against frac sand mining in our county in about 2012. There were five applications for frac sand mines in our county when we started. Today, there are no frac sand mines in Houston County, and there are no applications for frac sand mines in Houston County. Now, we haven't been able to pass a ban, but we fought these people to a standoff right now, okay? Um, and Jim Gurley is here today from uh, Winona County, where he and other people like him successfully got their county board to pass a ban, and it's being litigated. It's a big deal, and it's going to affect what happens in these other counties, depending on how the district court decides. But for five years, we have fought the pro frac sand mining people in our county, and uh, they haven't been able to get anything, okay? And it's been a real war, I can tell you. Next. Okay, so when we started this, uh, it was about... It was December of 2011, we had our first little meeting, and then we all started going to county board meetings. I should say, in Houston, in Minnesota, land use decisions are overwhelmingly invested in local government, particularly county government and city government, and occasionally a township will have uh, zoning. And it, it sounds quite a bit different from what you have here in Wisconsin, okay? Um, so we started going to county board meetings, and when I had been on the town board, and, and even in our township, our township, the La Crescent Township, um, has its own zoning, and we've had many fights over the zoning issues there over the years, so I was pretty knowledgeable, but most people weren't. So we started going to county board meetings every single week. And pretty soon people realized, wow, there's this huge disconnect from what people were seeing at county board meetings compared to what actually was happening, okay, and what the zoning ordinance said. So we thought, well, we got to do something about this. So, so we put up a website, we called it Houston County Government Accountability Project, and then we thought, how can we effectively use this website? Well, we decided, rather than just putting articles on there, we were going to load it up with videos, okay? So we went out, we bought a $350 typical video camera, and we started going to county board meetings and videoing what these people were saying and doing. Next. Now, again, I don't know what things are like in Wisconsin, but in Minnesota, we have an incredibly tough open meeting law, okay? It's unbelievable. With very few exceptions, every meeting of a government body, whether it's a planning commission, a board of adjustment, a county board, a school board, has to be open to the public. They have to speak and confer so that you can hear them. You have a right to any documents that are discussed or passed around or handed out at those meetings. And 
You have a right to make audio or video recordings of those meetings as long as you don't disrupt those meetings, okay? So, we started going to every board meeting and videoing what was being said. Robin downloaded some editing software online and we started putting all these videos online. Well, you know, the roof blew off the county. We would take our emails, a lot of us had big email lists, especially those, like we had a big email list because I had run for the legislature, and we'd send out a link and say, with a short blurb that says, so-and-so did this today at the county board meeting. We'd get up to 200 hits a day sometimes on these things, and that would go on for several days. And we'd go to the next board meeting, and we'd do it again next week, and so on. It got to be incredible. This really set fire under the frac sand mining issue in Houston County, okay? It drove the county board up the wall, literally. So, next. Now, <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a tall, big man, okay? So I can walk around with a video camera and nobody tries to threaten me too much if they don't like the fact that we're videoing. Um, but we had some pretty wild experiences in about in three years of doing this because the county board didn't want this to happen. They didn't like this, okay? Um, hopefully we've got this. Robin is going to pray. We've, first we got them to set up a study committee on frac sand mining, which was a good idea. But the pro-frac sand mining people didn't like the composition of it because we had about half just regular citizens on there, people on our side of the issue. So then they disbanded that and they set up a study committee of just county agency people. Okay, so they're going along. And, um, it was very obvious that it was going to be pro frac and mining, and so we put up these videos and so on. And we have one here. If you want to see the devastating effect of what a video will do, post it on a website that anybody in the county can access. Go. Might have to explain it a little bit. she was appointed to be chair of the study committee. When we put, it, it, you know, you wouldn't, nobody would know, have ever been aware of what she said or known it if we hadn't been there with a video camera, videoed it, and put it up on our website, okay? This really shook up a huge number of people in our county. Because we have a lot of, like any rural county, a lot of senior citizens. This blew the top off the frac sand mining issue in our county, okay? This was a great recruiting tool, to say the least. Um, and we did stuff like this for two and three years. We did so much of it, and the county board thought it was hurting them, them so bad, they hired a technologist to record their own meetings and put them online, okay? Well, this just made life easier for us, because if we couldn't get there to record it ourselves, we could just go on the county website take it off of there, put it on our own website, and send out an email blast to all kinds of people. And the nice thing about this, you know, people are busy in their life, and if you're a young family working eight to five, you can't go to a 10 o'clock in the morning county board meeting to see this stuff yourself. It was mostly retired people like us, or people who are in their second career, you know? So it was just incredible what was happening here. So then, you know, so that didn't help them any either. You know, we, in, 
But two other things happened. It started to be like we had a little movie studio because we would go there during the public comment period with really prepared comments that were really pointed. And of course, they would all get recorded on the county's video and be published a day or two later, okay? So we were, you know, like we were in the movies, you might say. <laughs> so that, the county board, it took them about six months to figure out what we were doing. So then they started really restricting the public comment period. In fact, at one point they tried to eliminate it completely because we were using it like a movie studio, you might say. So um, this was quite an interesting thing, but you know, our website, you know, everybody's got websites for everything nowadays, and most of it is written content, but this was like 90% video content. I mean, we'd have like half a dozen or more, you know, videos on there that were two weeks old or less uh, that people could just click on. And Robin had got this software. We could do a video at 10 o'clock at our county board meeting, come home, Robin would take a half an hour to an hour and edit it and have it up on the website. So, you know, within an hour, hour and a half of a board meeting, people all over the county could be viewing what was being said. So, this was really a powerful tool for communicating to affect public opinion on the frac sand mining issue. Okay, next. We ran three legislative campaigns, and, uh, you know, you would go to campaign schools, read campaign books. One of the things that we used really effectively in our political campaigns was direct mail. And I'm going to pass around some samples here so you can kind of have a real feel for what we did. Uh, okay. Um, so we got really good at direct mail. In our first campaign, we, we made 28 different pieces of direct mail. Robin designed them all. And uh, if you just pass those around. Um, and we got hooked up with a mail uh, publication company in La Crosse. We never went over there, we just emailed them over there. They would print them, uh, print them for us and take them to the mailbox, post office. So we got really good at that. So we thought, well, how can we use this knowledge in our work in Sprax and Mining? What? Yeah. So this is a couple examples of, of uh, direct mail we designed for our campaigns. How many of you have ever gotten a piece of direct mail in the mailbox during an election? <laughs> How many of you have gotten more than five a day in the election? <laughs> uh, now, there are a lot of ways to use direct mail. You use them differently depending on what you're doing. For campaigns, you use them one way. You know, in campaigns, a lot of people say, I don't even read this stuff, I just throw it away, okay? But that's okay, because in campaigns, direct mail is only intended to move about maybe 1% of the people who get there. But in advocacy, like working on frac sand mining, direct mail is really good at informing people, okay? This yellow one here. We, we held a couple of educational forums around the county, like in the Spring Grove area, in the Caledonia area, and we would send these out to most of the people in those areas, just a simple piece of direct mail. We had really good turnouts because of this, much better than if we placed an ad in the local weekly paper. Our local weekly paper is less than 20% of the people subscribe to those papers, whereas this goes into every household, okay? Next. Now, we got to a point where there was a motion or a resolution before the county board to ban frac sand mining or write an ordinance to ban frac sand mining. We had two wayward commissioners, Teresa Walter and Steve Schultz. And we have commissioner elections by district. So we sent this piece of direct mail to every voter in their district. Just pass that around. Pardon me? Every, yes, we were using every door direct mail. That's something the post office offers where it will go to every uh, mailbox on the routes, okay? And these included both rural routes and the cities as well. And you can see that we made a point of asking people to either call or email. And we, gave, we gave their phone number and their email address. These, 
These commissioners literally had to take their phone off the hook. This worked like nothing, anything anyone had ever seen in our county before. They got literally hundreds of calls and hundreds of emails because of this piece of direct mail, okay? And it really works good because, you know, some people will go to a meeting and speak up, but other people don't feel quite that bold, so they're willing to send an email. Some people might be willing to write a letter to the editor, but some people are much more comfortable just making a phone call. So you have to figure out what works. You have to give people a variety of options to do things, okay, and not expect everybody to come to a meeting and stand up and be really vocal because a lot of people aren't that type of people. So we were really attuned to that. We tried to give people a choice of activities and it really worked dynamite. I mean, these people, staff people in the county said they couldn't believe it. Their phone lines had almost melted down, these two commissioners, because they got so many calls. Next. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so we had this resolution in front of the county board, and we uh, did we send out a piece of we sent out a message? oh yeah that was a big direct mail to come to this uh, public hearing. We had 300 people turned out for this public hearing. Okay, in a county of 18,000, nobody had ever seen anything like that before. There was standing room only in the county board. We had four to five hours of testimony where you could speak, I think, three minutes each. We had a hundred people testify. And, uh, you know, it was just overwhelmingly to ban frac sand mining in our county. Um, and so, so here, we actually combined direct mail and videoing for our website. Robin wanted to play this. Now, hold it off a sec. So, several of us worked real hard to get people to come to these meetings and to help we sent out a guide on how to prepare testimony and suggestions for things to say. And, and so we really worked at this. I happen to have a friend who's a really good guy, who's a musician. I called him up and I said, Bob, we need you to come and testify. He says, sure. I said, Bob, how would you like to sing something for your testimony? He said, sure. <laughs> and uh, as, as a lawyer friend of ours said, he had a lawyer who goes to public hearings and public meetings every single day of the week said, I have never been at a public hearing like this one. Go ahead. public meeting in your county and having that happen, okay? <laughs> it got the front page coverage and the front and uh, first story coverage on the, in the front page coverage in La Crosse Tribune and first story coverage in uh, TV stations in La Crosse. So it was really effective. Um, and then, let's see, do I have, you got the, okay, go ahead. Oh yeah, we all had band stickers stickers like this. Whenever we do anything big like this, we always print up stickers. Robin's real good at this. She can print them off. So we had 100 people there, or 200, 200 people there that had band stickers on them. So, go ahead. So, the county board actually passed a resolution to write up an ordinance to ban frac sand mining. And then in the two or three weeks between that and when they were going to finally vote, they got a lot of pushback from the mining industry. And we found out about it. So we sent out another direct mail piece. County board backpedaling from prohibiting frac sand mining. And we went through the whole thing again. So they, we didn't get it passed. They kind of devoted to table it. I can't exactly remember what it was. 
Um, but we turned out a big group of people again using the postcard. So, uh, well, we also use direct mail to help try to elect people to the county board who would vote support of Fragstan and Bruce Q. Michael. Maybe some of you have met him or heard of him. He's been real active. He was in one of the commissioner districts. Um, this is in 2016. Two commissioners who had been pro frac sand mining were defeated, one in the primary and one in the general, and next. Here's the guy who was defeated in the third commissioner's district. He was chairman of the planning commission for the four and a half years up to this point. This is the election of 2016. These are nonpartisan elections. Who, uh, who really went out of his way to give us a hard time. He would have the sheriff drag people out of county board meetings or out of planning commission meetings. He would tell us we couldn't talk about things, about specific issues, about what was going on on the state level, about the need for renewable energies. This guy was really a bad guy. And when he announced that he was going to run for county board in April of 2016, I spent four months trying to figure out how I was going to defeat this guy. Most people thought he was going to win, okay? He was guy running against him was about 75 or 78 years old, an older retired farmer who's kind of stiff. And, uh, and this guy's a young guy, he's a Democrat. I've known him for a long time, I always thought he was a good guy until he got to be planning commission chairman. Um, so I spent four months thinking about how we're going to defeat this guy. And so finally we put out this piece of direct mail. hope it doesn't run everybody the wrong way, but um, it worked. We sent it to 1,700 homes about three weeks before the election. He lost by 100 votes from a guy who was supposed to win. Okay, next. Another technique we've used, and I think we should use a lot more of, is having big rallies, okay? We had, a year and a half ago, the frac sand mining industry was planning to have was going to have a conference in La Crosse at the La Crosse Center. When we found out about it, we started debating and discussing what we should do. And, uh, you know, some people thought we should protest. I thought we should have a rally, a really big rally. And a lot of people said, no, we can't do it, we can't put it together in time. Um, but I knew we could. And so we had a really big, if you're familiar with the La Crosse Center in La Crosse, there's a big plaza there, and that's where the frac sand industry in Wisconsin Midwest was having a conference, so we went and reserved the plaza right out in front. So while they were having the frac sand conference inside, we were having this big anti frac sand rally outside. What's next? So the first thing we did is we formed an alliance with any groups that wanted to be part of this, and I'm pretty sure Save the Hills was part of that alliance. Just a temporary alliance for that one event. We got a lot of community groups from around the Midwest. We got a number of, of uh, faith-based groups. And we all formed this alliance to say that frac sand mining was not good for the future of the Midwest. Two days before the rally and conference, we held a press conference where everybody who was a member of the alliance had a speaker. It was great. We got great publicity and coverage from that. And then we held the rally on, uh, I think it was a Friday or a Saturday, right as the conference was going on. Go ahead. And uh, we've got another video we want to show of the rally a little bit later. Oh, there it is. Okay, this was, uh, and you can see down below, I hope you can read it, some of the two different groups that were part of this alliance. And this was on our, this was where we were using our webpage as well as the idea of having a rally together. We try to use our media together so they complement each other, our ways of communicating. Um, so you're promoting the idea of rallies, and, and you said um, that some people wanted to have a protest, and you wanted to have a rally, so could you distinguish well, your ideas of those two? Sure, by protest they meant, you know, just having a few people stand on the corner or on the curb with signs. Okay, but we wanted to deliver a much bigger message than that, um, and we'll see it in a minute in the video on that. Um, and a lot of people felt we couldn't organize a rally in less than two weeks. I really felt we could, and we did. And so, you know, a lot of times people are reluctant to try things because they think they don't have enough time. 
or energy. And I managed to convince a few people that we could do it, and so we did. And I, it had such a big impact. We got so much positive press and media out of this. Media likes controversy. The fact that there was a frac sand mining conference by the industry inside, and there was this huge group of protesters outside is exactly what the media said. Man is shaking their head there. The media loves controversy, okay? They love to see people dueling it out, being able to give both sides an opportunity to comment on things. And we got tremendous media. We really, I sell a lot of hay all over western Wisconsin, and I had my customers all over, because I was showed up on one of these uh, newscasts. And we had all three TV stations there covering it live, if you can believe that. And my customers all mentioned that they saw me on television. That's, that was worth $10,000 of media just doing that. Yes? Do you think having the rally instead of protesting? See, the rally sounds like it's, it's a more positive, proactive, mm -hmm. where protesting is a negative kind of Yeah. Going on. It's sort of a semantic thing, but you know, it was sort of a protest rally, I guess you might say. <laughs> uh, we were against whatever they were for, let's put it that way. Um, but it really worked, you know, and people really got into it. And the worst part of it, interesting, it was a real cold and rainy day. It looked like it was going to rain like that. People came anyhow, you know. So uh, when we get, a, get to the end, we got the final uh, thing on that. Go ahead. So, so this is a case of where we kept, we were using our media, our communications techniques together. We were using direct mail to publicize it. We were using the video. Obviously, we recorded it and put it all on our website. We had an hour and a half of, of, uh, of this rally on our website. We had used a press conference two days before. We used this technique of forming an alliance to draw in members of people from all over the state. They, of course, would email this out to their big memberships. This was a huge thing, and it really worked quite successfully. Forrest, you were involved with that, weren't you? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, okay, there it is, yes. Right on the bottom. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, so, so we do a lot of things. We do, we just had a big shootout this week. Jim Gurley was there, I was there in Minneapolis and St. Paul on Wednesday for the Environmental Quality Board. Whenever we go to something like that, we always print off stickers for our side, so everybody can wear a sticker to a meeting of the Environmental Quality Board. It looks great. You go in there, you got 16, 20 people, they all got yellow stickers. Lost the microphone. Um, okay, there we go. I know, that's why I yes. um, it, it really looks good when you can go into a meeting. Robin printed these off. We just use regular volume tags, and she printed them off in five minutes. And so we all go to a meeting, and we're all wearing a sticker to convey some solidarity. Um, just another little te technique for communicating with government bodies, okay? Otherwise, if you're not, you know, our Environmental Quality Board is 14 people. If you're sitting up there and you see 30 people in the audience, you don't know who's on what side or the other. On the other hand, if everybody on one side is wearing a yellow sticker, you get a pretty good impression of what the public sentiment is. So, it's just another little technique that we've learned to use, okay? So, you know, as I said in my blurb, um, I came of age politically during the 1960s, during the anti-Vietnam War movement, and been doing a lot of politics all these years. And, um, you know, I have certain opinions about the right wing in this country, and I, I realize it, so I'm, but I'm not going to go into that. But I think those of us on the side of trying to protect our natural resources, our heritage, um, our quality of life, people who want to deal with climate change, I think we're losing, okay? And you can blame a lot of that on the current president, and what's happening in the EPA, and the uh, Department of Energy, and so on. And they're responsible for most of it. But I also think that some of it is a part of it. Some of the blame has to be on the part of those of us who are advocating for all these things. I feel we're underperforming, okay? We have a lot of talent on our side. We have a lot of professional people on our side. We have a lot of enthusiasm. We have a lot of young millennials who are really good on all this technology stuff. I'm not, okay? If it wasn't for my wife, <laughs> we wouldn't be able to do any of this, to be honest. 
I get lost on a computer. I usually end up swearing at them once a day or something. Uh, but we're underperforming on our side. We need to think faster and smarter and do more things. We can do anything that corporate America does. We can match the Koch brothers. We can match the Heartland Institute. About a year and a half ago, I almost had a group of people convinced to take on the Heartland Institute. For the, everybody know who the Heartland Institute is? Well, they're a, uh, what would you call them, a right wing? Oh, all sorts of things. Think tank. Think tank, think tank. Think tank. yeah. Um, I don't know, they're based in Wisconsin or Chicago or someplace? Illinois, that's right. And they generate, they put, and I can remember it from when I was in the legislature 10 years ago, every month, they put really slick, polished propaganda for their side of environmental issues in the hands of legislators, local county elected officials, township officials, city officials. Nobody's out there matching them. Nobody's out there offering a counter narrative. And I almost had enough people talked into this about a year ago to do that. And that's one of my goals for 2018 is we can do that. We can match these people. We can produce slick, polished, really good, referenced, resourced narratives and uh, public relations pieces and literature and scientific reports that will counter everything they say and make the case for the kind of things we want. We can do that, people. I'm convinced we can. We have enough talent on our side. We just need to get organized. And part of that organizing is we need to focus on results, not so much in process. Nothing turns people off more than coming to a meeting on some specific thing where you talk two hours and don't get anything done, okay? We've all been to enough meetings in life. Um, we need to get people on our side thinking faster, smarter, bigger, not focus so much on process, on making sure that we've included everyone, every single thing. It drives me nuts when we sit at meetings and a 20-year-old has as much say and influence and time as some of us who are quite a bit older who have been out there in the political arena for the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, okay? You know, that's just a reality. The older you get, if you're paying attention, you learn a lot more and you know a lot more things to do on how to make things happen. And again, I, we're too hard, it's, I gave a speech something like this about a year and a half ago to a, some neighborhood groups in the Twin Cities, and I said, you know, this is funny because the first date my wife and I ever went out on, we went to the movie Mission Impossible, okay, which kind of describes our life. <laughs> um, but I said to this group of people, talking on the same line, I said, you know, if your mission statement takes more than 10 minutes to write, your mission is going to be impossible. And that's because if you're only going to focus on your mission statement and on the operating your group and so on, you're going to miss a lot of valuable opportunities and time to really do the things you really would like to do, okay? And I really believe that. You have to, we all have to work at in groups and get this mentality where we're going to get things done faster. People have to think bigger. You know, we're no longer just Midwest. We're part of a global community. Um, and we have to do that. Now, again, I'm, for me to be here, if you knew me all my life, one of my earliest memories when I was six years old, my dad had a two-horse, one-row cultivator. And my job was to walk behind the cultivator and uncover corn that got covered up when the ground came off the shelves, okay? So here I am today using technology that wasn't even imaginable then. I used to, in the legislature, come over early in the morning about 6 o'clock, open my laptop, and read the news. And I could read on the Xinxu Chinese uh, news service about what happened in the U.S. Congress the day before. I mean, think of that technology jump from when I was a little kid to now. We're no longer just mom and pop Midwesterners. We really have to, if we're going to defend what we think is important, we're going to have to use every technique that anybody uses nowadays. You know, our Houston County Protectors Group, we never became a nonprofit and for two reasons. One is we wonder we wanted to be a political group, okay? And secondly, we didn't want to go through all the hassle and bureaucracy of keeping our group organized and functioning. We make a lot of decisions online. 
you know, we have this network, we have arguments online, we, whenever we do anything, we'll send a draft out online for people to comment on and give feedback to. It's all very fast and efficient, so. Uh, nobody wants the blog. <laughs> We just keep firing emails back and forth, you know. We have a large email list. Yeah. We've uh, worked together on Fraxan, and through that email process, um, going back and forth with opinions, ideas, strategies. I had a blog actually on the website initially, and not one person ever said anything. <laughs> and, after, and I tried it multiple times. I tried renaming it. I tried sending out email. Nobody wanted to blog, and so we gave up on that idea. Some things will work and some things won't. So, uh, Robin, next one. Here's the last slide. This was of our rally. I think we should do more rallies. I think Trump really, I think one of the smartest things Trump did, whether you like him or not, was to have all these rallies around the country. It can, most people don't read polls, okay? But when they see on television, Huge numbers of people enthusiastically coming out and supporting something that sends a big message to a lot of people. And this rally we had in La Crosse a year and a half ago in front of the La Crosse Center was dynamite. Go ahead. Actually, 
Our ordinance, our zoning ordinance, allows citizens to make a proposal for an ordinance. So we made a proposal, I think it was about two years ago now, for a draft, or for a ban ordinance. And we paid the 400 bucks, and we made the planning commission sit there and listen to it. It generated a huge amount of interest. I personally sent out letters to every mining company in our county, and the head of mine in our county, which is about a dozen, inviting them, explaining the whole thing to it. They all came to this public hearing, and to a, to a mine, they all said, we're not interested in doing frac sand mining, okay? And we got it all on video, of course. Um, so you, I guess it's tough, but you gotta keep on thinking of unique techniques and approaches to create controversy. Um, controversy sells newspapers. <laughs> In our county, the newspapers love us because we create a lot of controversy to keep readership up. Um, but it's real tough. There's no getting around it. So I like the idea of videotaping, you know, public meetings. It's just a matter of, you know, how do you reach your audience when you're talking about it at a lower level of government, such as yeah. You know, I, mean, I mean, we have town supervisors that don't even own a computer, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Well, again, so, so we send out... So that tells yeah. you something about the town itself right. in terms of, you know, how many would actually view a video of a, public, of a town board meeting if you were to put it out there, you know, that's... Well, what you know, your membership or your supporters, if you got their emails, we don't care about our local government people to some extent. They're, we have local government people just like you're talking about. Okay, but we go around them by going to people um, who are interested in our issue and our side of it. We get their email address. Whenever we have a good video, we send out an email blast saying, here, check out our website, link onto this video, see what's happening. Um, it's really worked successfully, Rob. We also, at the, at the very beginning when we started the website, um, we actually posted flyers around the community and we also put letters to the editor in the paper saying, we started this website, this is the web address, you know, please check often, and you know, please write in, let us know what your interests are. Nobody took advantage of it, but I'm sure we got readers. I still have people, I, I still get, you know, I check the diagnostics on it, and I get people going to that website still every week, and I haven't put anything new on there in months. Just, and there hasn't been much going on recently to even put it on there. If, if it heats up again, I'll start it up again and let people know that we're active again. And we may find a new use for it as well with some other things that we're thinking about doing. But yeah. uh, I, it, it was a pretty painless thing to do once I started the website. At first it took a pretty intense amount of time, especially learning how to edit the videos, which with the right software is extremely easy. If you get the wrong software, it's a pain in the rear end. And the right right. Well, I started using VideoPad, and I would recommend that highly. It was very easy to use. So, um, it, yeah, it's just VideoPad, and I think it was free, but I might have paid a little bit of money for it. Let me ask you, what would you think about a regional coalition against frac sand mining, because we've toyed with this idea of trying to organize with Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Iowa into a big regional thing. You know, we'd love to use our website for that. And, uh, you know, it might help what you're talking about, where we could have tabs or links, you know, this is what's going on in this township or this county or something like that. It would be really easy to, to reformat it and give different counties a link and then have some, you know, some pages under that for different townships. I mean, that would be really a pretty simple thing like, to do. Well, like the Midwest Government Accountability Project. <laughs> of the I, I think it was talked about a few years ago and yeah. even had been tried. Wasn't that the uh, Vaccine Awareness Project five years ago? Is that right? Some of the yep. here that, that kind of oh, no. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> That, that sort of collapsed under its own weight in a lot of ways. You've got to be careful. It's tough to get those things going and tough to keep them going. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, we, we just had to take a rest from it, sort of. And a lot of other people did, too. We, we're also fighting. In our county, we're really concerned that there was a, like a list of 130 uh, non-conforming mines. And we always thought that they would be the vehicles to bring frac sand mining into our county. So we've waged... An Incredible war against non-conforming mines for the last three or four years. 
And that's consuming a lot of our energy right now. And there's not a big constituency for that, even in our own county. <coughs> but, you know, we've become, we've got like 15 to 20 people in our Houston County Protectors, and we're a pretty tough group of people after this amount of time. There's nothing we can't do and won't do and haven't done uh, to advocate for our interests. So. Well, you know, granted, my uh, interest is at the local town level. Sure. Right? The other thing is, is I live on, I'm located on the east side of Eau Claire County, and county supervisors don't know we exist. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're focused on the city of Eau Claire, and, and you've heard about the big confluence project and all that sort of thing. I mean, if you'd asked a, town, or a county supervisor, you know, have you been to, you know, um, the, the Spraxan mines out in town of Bridge Creek, or have you been and visited Fairchild, they probably say, where's that? You know, what so technique we used early on when we still were trying to get along with the county board is we actually rented or chartered buses and took groups of people out. And we we that, talked about that as yeah. well, just to, just to make it, you know, a, a sponsor a field day. Yes. You know, to try and get that organized. We, we came up here to Wisconsin and <laughs> showed them the <laughs> devastation of Fracks and Mining in your state. Yeah. Uh, great technique. If you're wondering how we paid for all these direct mail things, you know, we paid for it out of our own pockets. Uh, some of us put thousands of bucks into it, a larger group of people put money into it. Um, we thought, thought it was worth the fight, frankly, and like I said, we fought them to a standoff in our county, and they were ready to open up mines like crazy. So, Jim. Uh, yeah, in response to Don's earlier uh, question about uh, how do you keep up enthusiasm and interest in the lull periods and so forth. I think one thing that's important is timing. Whenever there's to be on the lookout for some event or development or whatever that you can immediately capitalize on for a rally, for whatever you want to use, because timing is so important. But I think that, and I, I would differ with, with Ken somewhat on, on the importance of processing meetings, but organ organizing, in my experience, is all relational. It's all about person to person. It's all about human beings and emotions and feelings and what, what's important to us. <clears throat> and so um, I think it's real important to have social gatherings, to have potlucks, to have things all the time where you can get together and form emotional and friendship bonds with people. And you can do that sort of thing in sort of the low periods, too, because that once you know someone and can work with them, you, you can work with them on projects as well. That's my turn. Jim and I disagree. <laughs> it's the first time, too. <laughs> but but no. we do do a lot of that. Yeah. You know, not everybody always goes to it, but we have a Houston County Protectors, this HCP group, and, and we do, I mean, even though their meetings are usually quite social, sometimes they're out on somebody's patio or... Yeah. that there are a lot of people in our group that are just really busy and don't have the time for that. I mean, Ken works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know. <laughs> so he doesn't have the time for that kind of stuff that a lot of other people have. You know, it's, it's real tough to strike a balancing, a balance on all these things. I mean, that's, the important thing is to always stay flexible. 
in terms of your expectations of what other people will do or are willing to do, in terms of your own energy levels. Uh, I mean, I'm not a guy who wears out very easily, but we we kind of had a layoff for six months because we were exhausted from all this. Um, you know, it, it just it's it's just important to read the situation and to adapt to it. Okay, but to always keep, as Jim says, when events come up, you want to make sure you can focus on those quickly and respond and react to them. Um, a lot is hanging in our state on what happens with the ban, the lawsuit against the ban in Winona County. That will determine where we're going to go in our state on frac sand mining. Yes? Go ahead. Paul, are you familiar with the approach of fee and dividend, putting a fee at the site of the mine or the wellhead or the um, frac site? Are you familiar with that? No. Go ahead. Are you talking about carbon tax? It's not a tax. Be at the site where it's mined, be it sand or the gas or the oil or the coal. And then those fees are being distributed among all the households in the United States. This has bipartisan support. You can have support of some of the major industries. Can we get to that on YouTube? Just like that. Two minutes and explain it for the entire world. Where do we put that? How do we see it? Um, type in, uh, do a search, uh, CCL, which stands for Citizens Climate Lobby, and just look for YouTube. Right. I'm familiar, yeah, do CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby. That puts the market to work. Mm -hmm. This gentleman here, and then, did you have a question? Somebody, this lady, yes. Yeah. state of Gaylord Nelson, who started Earth Day 50 years ago. My God, I mean, you know, I mean, it's just so heartbreaking to see what's happening. It's like 80 years of effort is going down the drain here in, a, you know, a few months. So. I hate to interrupt. It's been great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. But we do have to, uh, 3 o'clock has arrived and passed us. Uh, The Health Alliance funded a number of projects in 2017. We have an annual report here if you'd like to read that. We'd like to allow some of the recipients to respond briefly to what they use the funds for. I know Crawford County Stewardship is here, and if you take just a minute and tell us what you used our donation for. Yeah, thanks. Uh, really appreciate Save the Hills Alliance for giving us, this is actually our second year <coughs> that we've received 
this grant from them, helping us, uh, Crawford Stewardship Project, do our karst landscapes and groundwater susceptibility survey of Crawford County. We're starting with Crawford County. We hope to, once this is finished, spread this to other driftless area karstic counties. Most of the work we're doing, we're documenting all the methodology. We're hoping to craft this in such a way that it would be easy for surrounding counties to also take this and take the same data that we were able to access and do it themselves. So we're, like I said, we're in year two. We've developed a fair amount of maps already. Most of it is from existing information that's already sitting around on federal government data sheets that aren't very useful to anyone. So we're taking that information, putting it in map form that people can actually use. Uh, so far, we have a depth to bedrock map a soil parent material map, a hydrological factors map, a state spreading restrictions map, and an underlying carbonate bedrock map. All those were existing data already out there. Nothing needed except uh, the knowledge of who to request the information from and the software, which is free if you know how to access it and use it to put it into maps. Uh, we have a couple cartographers working with us uh, with Legion GIS. They've been very helpful. Uh, I'm not a cartographer, so it's helpful to have that expertise on board. And much of the funds we've gotten has been used to help pay them for their services. Um, we're also developing a fracture pattern map and a well map that we've actually gone through well construction reports and gone through the LIDAR data, which is available for all of Southwest Wisconsin, I know, and is a way to see the surface of the landscape very clearly. It strips off all the surface vegetation and everything, so you can see sinkholes and valleys and things pop up just like that. Um, so those are two maps that we're having to do a little bit more of our own research to create, not just cut and pasting uh, data that's already available. Uh, we're working on creating a land use map, a groundwater hazard map, a highly permeable soils map, and finally, a sinkhole map. We're identifying sinkholes. We've had one citizen science event so far identifying sinkholes, and we'll be having another one on November 3rd, where we actually bring in the community, anyone's willing to come, open up a laptop, look through the LIDAR imagery and the aerial imagery that's already available to all of us and actually find sinkholes. So I think this is to some of the questions about how to involve people and how to keep people engaged. I think coming forward and having some of this really meaningful citizen science is really helpful in uh, getting and keeping people engaged. Um, so yeah, we've had, we've had a lot of luck and a lot of interest with our citizen science events and it's been really helpful to us instead of me spending hundreds of hours staring at a screen, we can have an event and a good time and bring in people and in two hours do 100 hours of work. So that's been really helpful um, as well. We've also been hosting karst field trips where we have a presentation about the karst geology and then we take people to sites where there's sinkholes and uh, road cuts where you can see the karst geology and all the fracturing throughout the bedrock in this area. It's very apparent when you know what to look for and you have experts explaining it to you. So um, that's what we have so far. We're going to be putting all these maps on an online platform that is going to be accessible. You'll be able to turn on and off different map layers, looking for different things. Um, so we're really excited to get all that up and running. Um, we're running a little bit behind schedule just because the literature review is taking much longer than I anticipated it would, um, which is also good because there's a lot of information out there already published on this stuff. It just needs to get out there into people's hands so that we can all realize how sensitive this landscape is and uh, hopefully take the appropriate precautions to protect it. So, yes, thank you for the Hills Alliance for your funds.
but the citizens are both from Dunn County and uh, Chippewa County. The mine um, has a deadline of getting studies in uh, by the end of this year, 2017, and will be starting supposedly in uh, 2018. So we asked uh, loyalty, or we asked the Sacred Hills Alliance um, for funding to set up baseline studies before the mine actually started. Uh, we have Chris Wood Pierce um, working on baseline air studies done right next to the mine. And then we sent out um, oh, asking requests, asking people that would be willing to have their well water tested if they lived within a half mile of the proposed mine to have baseline water studies done. And that um, done, we've gotten 50% uh, of the people that are within a half a mile of the mine have had their water tested now. And uh, results have been sent to, or, and uh, being sent to both the Save the Hills, the people owning the um, property with the wells and the air testing site, the county health people, county boards, So we're very grateful for that. That way uh, people that something happens to their well water or their air can actually prove that it has happened since the coming of the month. Thank you again. Uh, a great group in Colfax trying to be proactive. They may get this dark mine because it's in Chippewa County and it's unzoned, but uh, they got plenty of data. Uh, next on my list is Track Tracker Alliance. They're not here today, but uh, they received a fairly large grant from us. I'm going to read, and I hope that doesn't bore you to death, but based on parcel ownership, we've identified an additional 55,000 acres of potential for Exxon mining in Wisconsin using GIS parcel data and ownership records associated with existing mining firms and adjacent landowners that have already leased or own land adjacent to existing mines. This acreage is 165% of the current 33,215 applied operational permitted reclamations in progress for frac sand mining spread across 21 Wisconsin central counties. So frac tracker has identified where the mine companies intend to go. And one last statement, we estimate that our map and land cover sensitive ecosystem analysis will be completed by January or February of 2018. So, Frack Director Alliance, Google them or ask them what they've done with their grant. Uh, but they are very active, uh, producing good usable data. Uh, another group that received funding from us was uh, UW Extension. We donated for a no-till drill so more farmers in the mining areas can plant cover crops using uh, a low-cost rental drill. A picture in our local, not much of them coming to us, but there was a picture of the green drill and we even got uh, credit for it. Uh, Dunn County? Dunn County. I'm sure it isn't isolated to Dunn County. There's like a consortium, I believe. Dwight, do you, you know something about that? No. Oh, no, no I... I familiar with the no-till drill concept. And that's yeah. When I worked in extension 25 years ago, I did that same extension, kind of thing. Uh, we bought a the tech college, uh, Great Plains, yeah. and then we rented it out. Yeah, that, same deal. Yep. It's, Except we funded a portion of it to make yep. it happen. Yep. Very worthwhile. Okay. Next, Alliance of Dunn County Sports and Conservation Clubs. Each year we uh, uh, co-sponsor an intern, a college student, working with the NR, uh, USDA, uh, I don't know the names of all the acronyms, and uh, uh, so we have a college student gets his hands and feet wet visiting farms. Should we do this right now, Cheryl? No, I'm just trying to get it out. I just want to make sure it works. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I haven't heard the results, but we, this is our third year we've ha hired an intern that gets shared primarily in Dunn County, but scatters out into all the adjoining counties. And he gets work experience, and he's active in his university with his conservation club and his group, etc. It's really getting our foot in the door. Um, he's an intern with SCHA. He's an intern of NRCS. We hire an intern that goes to the NRCS, uh, shares with DNR, and several other acronyms. Uh, that person
person would probably come to your group and, and, and tell what he learned and what's going on. And you, you can get a ton of information. And where do we go to get in contact with them? Just to you guys. Call Cheryl. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be coming to our next meeting. Yeah. He may be at our November meeting. Or December. Each of those internships have been rather amazing because these are outstanding young people. And of course, make sure they get routed to all the mines and all the neighborhoods. And they go back to the university and then they're applying for a job next year somewhere. So uh, I think it's a good link in, in getting hooked up with young people going into the, I don't know if you call it an industry, into the profession. Uh, we don't have anybody here from that group. Uh, Christine Consultant. Steve, give you a couple minutes to tell you what Steve's up to. Steve got a grant this year, right? Steve got a grant this year. I'm one of those people spending your money. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I'm spending your money on. My wife would tell you that about every two years I start a new project that's guaranteed to empty our checkbook as quickly as possible. This is this project. It's called WIS Community. Um, as a little bit of background, it's occurred to me that a lot of the news that goes around our rural areas, and I live on a farm right outside of Downsville, you know, not in the metropolis, but in the suburbs of Downsville. And um, a, a lot of the discussion that goes on is happening on mailing lists and all kinds of, you know, what you would consider old-fashioned computer technology, and, and this is great. And I thought, well, why can't we leverage that and do a little better job of it and incorporate some newer technology that works with it? So WIS Community is, as I see it, it's a utility. It's a place to post news and events and places and information about things in Wisconsin. And speaking off of Ken's talk, I guess what I would say is if you do this stuff he is talking about, it's a place to put it. So I really want your stuff. Uh, the site is organized around communities, which are either about a topic or an area. Uh, so there's one about, you know, Chippewa Valley. There are various different kinds of things. One of them is the environment. My grant from Save the Hills was to build and expand the environmental community, which is coming along, but I need your help, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, also building up the use of webinars by groups. If you're a group registered with us, you can, uh, oh, there it is. Uh, you can use the site to hold webinars online and we'll provide that to you. Uh, working at a directory of environmental groups in the state. If you are an environmental group, please be in touch with me and I'll put you in there because it's amazing how hard it is to find some people. Um, training and outreach, well, here I am today, and uh, I'm also planning on having an environmental summit in December or January, which I hope will be a place people can get together and talk about these things and uh, learn how to use this platform. And I'm going to the Lion Publishers Conference in Chicago next week, which I'm really excited about. Uh, it stands for Local Independent Online News and I'm trying to be accepted as a publisher in that group, which has a lot of advantages. But you can help. I need your help. Ways you can help are signing up for an account on the website. Um, really, it needs to have more people involved. Put in your events. Uh, Calendar is actually used pretty heavily. And um, some of it is automated, but a lot of it is people just posting stuff. Uh, post news about what's going on with your group. There are a whole bunch of brochures and business cards and junk like that back on the glass cabinet back there. Please take one or take more if you have people to hand them out to. Uh, you can spread the word about this either by, you know, like talking to people, because uh, we still believe in that, right? And uh, on social media and, you know, anywhere else you can share things. What I really need from all of you is ideas about things we could be doing better and things that would be helpful to your organization or, you know, whoever. Uh, I'd really like to leverage this better for people. It's a work in progress. I'm sure it will look very different in six months than it does right now. 
Uh, there's a lot of capability to put in video and audio. I've got a guy who is going around right now videotaping all of the uh, listening sessions that politicians are doing in southeastern Wisconsin. That's been interesting, uh, to say the least. Um, and we'll be having some trainings and online sessions, so if you come in and you're bewildered, there is help and there are some videos online and there will be more of that sort of thing in the future. So, if you are interested, either come and look at the site, sign up, get an account, come and talk to me, drop me an email, I want to hear from you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, one more thing, and I think you'll find it interesting. Look down pictures.com. Henry Bosch received a grant years ago, and another, another, come on, Peter, at your age, another, <laughs> and uh, he is using the uh, aerial device to take pictures for a lot of people in a lot of areas, primarily sand mines. Okay, the drone. Who you saying? Hi there. Um, former civil engineer, a techno nerd. I started with the uh, original concern chip for citizens about seven or nine years ago, I can't remember now. But uh, nobody wanted to do a website, so I said I guess they would. So I started it. And then I noticed that uh, there were some wonderful pictures being taken, but they were being taken from the ground. And the mines have uh, been raising ferns around the sides of them, so you can't see what's going on. You can't see what's going on inside. Thank you. So I decided that uh, the, the few airplane rides that uh, Mary took and, uh, and a couple of others were really wonderful, but they were very expensive. So I got into drones, uh, Save the Hills Alliance, helped me get uh, my first drone and my second drone, both of which I lost. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can't, and then they, uh, um, Cheryl said, we're doing it again, and I said, no, wait a minute. <laughs> I, I, I stood in front of the group and I said, listen, I'm a proven loser. <laughs> but they had faith in me and I thank you very much for it. The uh, unit that I have now is extremely reliable. Uh, that, that's the Fairmont Sandro. And if you bring up the 360 and turn the volume down. Uh, the uh, three, the three, 360 degree interactive uh, view of these things makes people crazy. I mean, I don't, I'm sure that Jerry never before, maybe you got inside there. Until, until you have driven down 12 and look on the left, all you can see is just a few little stacks sticking up. You can't really see much of anything. And then people see this thing and they say, holy mackerel, that thing is there? You know, most of the people in, in, in Miami have no idea. I have shown this to truck drivers and to employees. And he says, no. Yeah. I go in there every day and it's not there. But it's just like Google Earth. You can, and, 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 the, the technology is so fantastic. I can set, I, I take this thing up and I send it up over the over the center of the site, and then I tell it to take 34 pictures and it goes around this 34 pictures, and I put them together and something like that. And it's just like Google Earth. You can zoom in and out. You can uh, you can almost read the truck the license on the truck on the truck that's down in the bottom of the hole there. I see that I've got the soybeans combine today. <laughs> <laughs> and you yeah. are, you offer your Oh yes, yes. Uh, if actually, if you can that, bring that, bring up the um, this Wisconsin Propens CTR. Just don't go too far down. Right? Be very careful. If you get down at the bottom, it, it drops out. But if you, if you if you get to the CTR, you'll see that I'm doing a mine down there, which which started off. I didn't quite get there before they before it was all green, but they had stripped off, stripped it off, and you can see the original mine. And then I, I I've been going down there every week. And uh, yeah, uh, now go up, go up a little bit. Let's see, uh, is it which mine is that? That's a bad, that's a badger. You went too far. So go back, go, go back up to the menu and, and just slide down carefully. You're, you're, you're looking for that is the last two, bot, bot, Wisconsin, Wisconsin Pro. And you have to be very careful not to go too down, too far. There it is. Uh, not Hexton, not Hexton, <laughs> uh, That's the one by me. I'm trying. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay, that's it, right there. Alma Center? Yeah, Alma Center. Alma Center.
center has been, I've been, I guess I've got six weeks of uh, growth on the thing, and it's the most amazing thing. People are just looking at this and they're saying it's horrifying. And uh, you can see on the, on the bottom of this thing, each one of these is a separate video. That's, that, that was done on 824, and if you slide to the right, you can go over, you, you can go over to the latest one. Okay, a little bit slow. But you keep going over there, you're still looking at that first video. So keep coming, keep coming to the right if you can. What you're, what you're after is, is 19. Keep coming. Come over here. 10. It's 1019 is what you're looking for. Oh, okay. And, and then click on it. Well, that's what it used to look like. And, and click on it again. I don't think you got it yet. That's it. That's it. That's the, that's the 1019 one. And you can see they're building, they're building great big firms on this side and on this side and on that side. And uh, it's, it's, it's the most amazing thing. And uh, if you can back up one. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't work very well on this machine here. But anyway, uh, if you've got the, uh, you've got the interest to see what, they're, see what they're doing and follow it, you can, you can see what's, exact, what's happening on each one of these things. On the table is a card. If your cell phone is smart enough or got that QR app on it, all you got to do is take a picture of that and then go right to the website and you can, uh, you can wander around in there. If you've got any comments or, or uh, questions on there, you can contact me, you can get a hold of me. Uh, I am starting into doing infrared taking of uh, the temperature of the ground around the, um, the holding pond. It's my opinion that as the water runs through the side of the holding pond, because it isn't a, 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 a really good container, it's going to cool that ground, and I, I'll be able to fly over the top and see if the ground is hot here, the ground is cold here, and the ground is hot there. And so I can say, okay, now you've got a leak here, fix the darn thing. But the problem is I'm having, I'm having a lot of problems with the software. It's a, it's a, it, as soon as it takes off, it shuts down. <laughs> My, my uh, drone, <laughs> so I don't have control of the drone anymore. I lose all my satellites, so we're working on the problem. But at any rate, uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the nerd, and uh, I, I, I am taking, if you've, got, if you've got something that ought to be photographed, get a hold of me. I'm on the, I'm on the uh, uh, website, and I will see, see if I can, I can get to you. But uh, that, that's basically why I've been spending all your money.